you don't have the nearest file. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the audience and the members here. There. Um, welcome to the October regular meeting of the Harbor Advisory Board. Uh, our chairman, Mr. Reisner, will be absent tonight. Uh, Mr. Dowdy, perhaps, but with five members present, we do have a quorum and can call the meeting to order. If we will start with a moment of silence. And Sharif? Would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So we come to uh, announcements and presentations. Mr. Makowetsky, our liaison with the city, will also be absent tonight. So Peter, would you like to go first? Do you have any announcement or presentation? Owen today. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. Okay. Mark? Uh, no announcements this morning. Okay. Dana? I uh, just wanted to remind everybody that uh, this is, October is Maritime Heritage Month, and uh, it was kicked off by last weekend by the opening of the Maritime Museum. So that was quite the event. It was very well attended, and uh, the last few weeks leading up to it, we got a lot of stuff done, so it was... Uh, it was quite a, quite a group and quite a celebration. How many people do you think attended, Dana? Oh, I don't know. It was... I, I think I must have seen several hundred. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, Dan Krieger, I find very interesting to listen to. His, uh, his knowledge of history, local history, is amazing. And, uh, and then it finished off with uh, a couple members of the Slinen tribe, uh, Don... Don Pierce Jr., who is actually also on the board of the Maritime uh, Museum, uh, spoke, and, and it was it was really it was really a nice nice grand opening. Sharif, nothing to announce today. Okay. Okay. Uh, we can now open it up for public comment from anything from the public. Uh, that is not on the agenda tonight or for those who would be unable to stay until their topic did come up. Nothing from the audience. We close public comment. Uh, on the consent calendar, we have none. Go on to reports. And Mr. Endersby, if you will, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, our monthly status report. A uh, fair number of things to report on here. There's our usual statistics and Harbor Patrol stuff we'll start out with. Um, had about 20 emergency responses over about the last month, 136 calls for service, 39 assists, uh, about 32 enforcement actions, and 13 weather warnings. As we get into the fall, we're starting to see some weather, which is great, including some rain. We got a half inch yesterday of rain. Um, too bad Gene's not here because he always likes to report on the creatures in the bay and whatnot, but uh, there's been a lot of life. We've had warm water. It's finally cooled off a little bit with some of the wind, but we had water that was in the mid-60s for a while, um, bringing sea bass and a lot of people catching a lot of halibut, a lot of dolphins, bait fish, birds, um, humpback whales. Fishing's been great. Um, a lot of halibut have been getting caught. Um, rockfish has just been, been a really good summer, so hopefully that continues on. The water stays warm for a little bit longer. Um, a few weeks ago, you may have seen something bright orange kind of wandering out on the horizon and off the, off the surf line between 
Caicos and Morro Bay, and it was a relatively new piece of technology that's floating around the world's ocean. It's called a sail drone. Um, there's a, a picture of one in your staff report. It's bright orange. It's an autonomous drone. It's programmable. Um, they use them largely for scientific purposes, and this one that's cruising around here is doing fishery study work, where apparently it has a sounder where it, it tries to find, I, I think it's doing like bait fish type work, and it, it sounds, and if it finds a, a school of fish that it thinks worthy, it sends back to home. We found one, and then the, some ships follow up, research boats follow up and collect whatever data they're collecting. They're all over the world doing <coughs> um, sea temperature and wind and other data, and it's, it's got a large vertical um, sail that pivots that, that enables it to direct itself. And like I say, it's programmed via satellite, and they just cruise around sort of semi-autonomously, sailing around, picking up whatever data they pick up. So um, we had several reports that it was either windsurfer in distress because it stayed put out there, or a kayak sinking because it was sticking up and looked like something bright orange sinking, but it's not. Uh, appears to be gone now. Um, it's out of the area, um, but the, uh, if you Google it, um, I remember seeing a, um, a news story about it somewhere. It might have been on 60 Minutes or somewhere, but a um, fairly prominent news program. I remember seeing a story about it, and it's some entrepreneur that's putting these things out there and, and uh, making them useful to science, so watch out for those. They're interesting craft. September 12th, um, Becca Kelly and Mac Reinhardt, our lifeguard supervisor, um, went to Cal Poly for the annual WOW Week, which is Cal Poly's Week of Welcome, where they bring in all the new students. Um, several years ago, probably over a decade ago now, we were invited to Cal Poly after they had that um, tragic drowning of one of their WOW students, uh, Montana de Oro State Park. They came in and started asking us for a little bit of water safety advice to their WOW leaders. So basically, they've got about 700 kids that um, are the chaperones and leaders that bring in all the new thousands of kids and, and show them around. So um, we go every year. We've been doing it for probably 12, 14 years now. And so we went um, and gave a, a water safety and boating safety and um, talk story a bit with some of the students there on, uh, on WOW Week, so it was a good program. And then during WOW Week, um, we had close to 2,600 um, freshmen paddling around in kayaks in the bay. I mean, it was, um, if you've been around the county anywhere on Wild Week and you see groups of students around, they, they go all over the place. They do bicycling, kayaking, surfing. Um, they go all over, the, all over the county, and so I'm sure you saw them somewhere, but man, there was a lot of them on the bay. Um, didn't result in any major catastrophes, fortunately, and everything was relatively under control, so that was the good part. September 17th, they responded to a kite boarder reportedly in distress up off Cayucas. Um, turned out he lost his kite board and ended up swimming to shore north of Cayucas. Got to shore just fine and let his kite go. Um, for a while it kind of turned into an all agency, oh my god, somebody's missing response until all the fire agencies and everybody finally got a hold of the, the actual reporting party, which was the fellow that lost the kite and saying, no, I'm fine. I'm just letting it blow to shore and I'll pick it up when it, when it gets there. I don't know that it ever did. Um, but fortunately we were able to, to call that off because those when you start bringing all these fire assets and then you bring in CHP and the Air 70, things get pretty expensive pretty fast. So um, it's good we were able to call that one off. And our new patrol boat, 3864, the big boat, the big, big boat. It's out for maintenance right now for a few weeks. We've sent the out drives back to the manufacturer to get their servicing. Um, they've, I think, we're at about 3,000 hours on that boat now. And doing some other work on the engine and touching up paint and just doing some all around boat work. It'd be nice to have a boat yard to do it in, but. Uh, we do it in our own boat yard, and so you'll see that boat out of service for a little, little bit longer while it gets ready for this winter. Coastal cleanup day was a couple of weekends ago, September 15th. 1,300-odd volunteers picked up 5,688 pounds of trash throughout Slow County. There's a list of the um, highest-ranking things that were picked up. It's always pretty astounding what everybody finds. Uh, over 15,000 cigarette butts, 6,000 food wrappers, thousands of other pieces of plastic. Um, obviously plastic has is, is become pretty prominent these days in, in world news and what it's doing to our world's oceans. So um, the less it ends up on the beaches means the less it ends up on the ocean. So it's great that those volunteers are out there every year picking all that stuff up. Snowy plover fencing was removed the week of September 24th with the help of state parks and their vehicles they bring over there. So that fencing has come down for the season. Uh, breeding season will start back up in, I believe, the beginning, end of March, beginning of April. So we'll put that fencing back up. 
And that's again to keep folks out of the snowy plover nesting areas. Sea Otter Awareness Week was September 23rd to 29th. Uh, City Council adopted a proclamation for that um, at the last council meeting. And our patrol staff assisted uh, with state parks and some of the booths that they set up for public education in that regard. You may have noticed offshore the crane barge and tugboat and other heavy equipment uh, just off the high school. No, it's not fracking that's going on. It is the Dynagy power plant pipeline removal. Um, years ago that, that um, power plant and from what was originally built into the 90s used to run on bunker oil and that oil got tankered in by oil tankers that moored offshore and then hooked up to the pipeline and they ran the, the oil to the tank farm that is now gone. Um, now that the plant is pretty well decommissioned and non-operational, um, State Lands Commission, who's the underlying landlord of the submerged tidelands, has required them to remove the pipeline. So they've been doing that over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they went through, I think when they first came to us with this project and they started in the permitting, it was 2013, maybe 2014. And now it's 2018, so it took them that long to get all the permits to be able to do that. Um, so they removed the ocean portion of the pipeline first. That went out pretty easy. Um, it wasn't far below the surface. Basically the crane um, would, would draw down on it with a big, I don't know, big clipper of some sort, um, big hydraulic clipper that would go down, grab the pipe, clip it, and then they'd grab it with another um, same crane but with a different wire and, and grab it with a grappling arm and pull it up, put it on a separate barge to be towed away. Um, they got in as close as they could to the surf line with that part. Um, they've removed, the next part was the section under the surf line. That section was put in in the 50s, two pieces were put in, one in the 50s, I believe one in the 70s, by building a pier. And then in between the pier legs, they drove in sheet pile to create a coffer dam, dug out the sand in between, down about 15, 20 feet, and then laid the pipeline down in the trench down below, pulled out the um, sheet pile coffer down to, to bury the pipe. So there was no way to dig that back out. They certainly weren't going to go re-put a new pier out there and go do that all over again. Um, so the method they attempted to use was this hydraulic ram that, that they, so they dug up the pipe. Everybody probably saw the big hole on the, on the beach and the giant pile of sand. So they dug down about as close as they could get to the surf line as they could, um, found the pipe, cut it, uh, attached this big pneumatic, hydraulic pneumatic ram to it that rammed the pipe from the beach end with four million pounds of pressure uh, to try and drive it out while the barge hooked to the other end and pulled it with 200 and some odd thousand pounds of pressure to try and draw the pipe out. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. Um, they've used this method in other locations where these pipelines have been decommissioned and it does work. <coughs> what they estimate, the reason it didn't work was because the pipe, unlike a lot of pipelines that follow a straighter path, because this one went so deep, the curve as it went up and reached the surface, as they were ramming the pipe, they were ramming against the curb and curve instead of ramming it out the hole at the other end, so it failed. So. Uh, their plan, if that happened and this was all approved, that they'll just leave it in place. They'll bury it, cap it, um, and leave it in place. Then they'll remove the pipe going from the beach in the big hole back to the dunes um, through the creek. Unfortunately, it goes through that creek or swamp or um, the stagnant water back behind the sand berm there. They've had to get special permits to go into there. Uh, but they'll remove all that pipeline and then from the um, dunes to the power plant, it gets left in place and they fill that with concrete. So that one will be left in place so they won't dig that up. So that's the full story on the pipeline project. Um, we still get probably several calls a day and it seems like any time we send somebody on the beach to go drive on the beach, we get a million questions. So um, putting out a lot of information just so folks know what's going on and, and we've actually had a, people, a couple of people ask me if the fracking has started already. So um, no, it hasn't. It's removed that pipeline. So that should be wrapped up fairly soon. They're gonna get that, that section off the beach, regroom the beach and hopefully be gone and all the equipment will be gone. So the offshore wind farm update, um, Castle Winds, um, also called, or formerly called Trident Winds, they've, okay. Sorry? I have uh, a question on this. Do you have any idea how much this removal is, has cost? I do not, but I can get a number. Um, the Dynagy reps that I've run into in the field, um, here and there, and talking about you know the, the various, um, problems they've encountered. Um, finding tidewater gobies in the in the pond was one of them and they had some other problems and um, every time they were, were 
lamenting with me about the, the problems or the, the things, the hurdles they kept coming across that he would quote um, figures in the five to six digits. Well, you know, that cost me another $120,000 today to do that. So I'm sure it's in the multi, multi millions. Um, Thank you. But they have to remove it. So I'll try and get a number for next time. <clears throat> Anything else on those? So the offshore wind farm, um, Trident Winds, also known as Castle Winds, they've, they've combined with a German energy firm. Uh, they continue to pers pursue an offshore anchored wind farm about 30 miles northwest of Morro Bay, um, off the coast of Cambria, kind of hugging the southern end of the um, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Floating wind farm, um, BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, is the overarching permitting agency that has jurisdiction there that is working a process um, contingent with the state of California <coughs> to um, seek information and put those um, leases out there out to bid and, and figure out how to go through that process. Um, Trident Winds came to the city of Morro Bay probably three years ago um, with this idea of uh, building this farm and came to the city and said, you know, what are the problems? What do we need to do? How do we need, how do we be good neighbors? Um, we initially went to go um, approve a community benefits agreement with them, but they weren't quite ready, or at least um, city council wasn't ready to approve that. We wanted a few more things in place. Um, one of them was working with a commercial fishermen's organization for, with an agreement with them to, to make them happy with um, whatever BOEM was doing. My understanding is they're pretty close with that. Uh, they had to do an economic impact study on, on what the positive impacts on the, on the county would be, the community might be from the work and from the farm itself. Um, and now they're coming back to us to, to relook at a community benefits agreement that will be taken to the city council here in not too long. Um, next week on October 11th, and there's a flyer in your packet, and it's also on the city's website, it's on the city's calendar, and I'm just probably going to read from it to be the most accurate. Uh, public, info, public information session, offshore wind project presented by joint venture, venture partners Trident Winds and ENB, um, GMBH, that's their, their German financial firm. October 11th, 68 p.m. at the Morbay Community Center in the East and West Auditorium. So those big auditoriums, as soon as you go through the big doors straight ahead. Uh, they'll be doing a, um, an update presentation and then a Q&A session. It will be... Um, Moderated. They've got a moderator, um, Brad Britton, from a coaching and consulting company. Last time, if you remember, I think last year we had um, Don Maruska do the same sort of thing. So they gave an update last year on, on similar projects. So it's, it's moved along a little further. It's getting closer. Um, Boehm's getting closer to putting out the call for the leased areas to be put into consideration. And then once those are determined, then it goes into the competitive leasing process. It's pretty complicated. I'm sure you'll get a lot more better information on the 11th, so look out for that um, at the community center on October 11th next week. Any questions on that project? October 6th, uh, this Saturday, there's a lot of things coming up. Uh, we've got the Harbor Festival, obviously, the 30, what annual is it? 39th annual? Do you have a flyer for that? I'm probably getting ahead of myself. 37th Annual Harbor Festival. Um, in the core of the Embarcadero, um, not down at the northern end like it had historically been. I think we're probably four years into where it's been now, maybe five, probably four, three or four. Um, it's already starting to ramp up. You've probably seen um, no parking noticing already gone up and whatnot, so they're gearing up for that pretty quickly. Um, the Jesse King Memorial Paddle. Jesse King was a, a reserve harbor patrolman of ours. He was also a full-time Coast Guardsman when when he retired from the Coast Guard and then worked with us part-time. Um, helped us in our lifeguard and our junior lifeguard programs as well. Um, died in a diving accident um, up off Cambria. And so every year since, um, his family and, and others have joined and, and put together a memorial paddle race for him to raise funding for our junior lifeguard and lifeguard programs. Um, this year the race consists of a 3K and a 10K course. I think the 3K course both start at Coleman Beach. 3K goes about down to the launch ramp around channel marker 16 and back. 10K goes out the harbor around channel marker number 2, back inside, back towards the State Park Marina somewhere, and then back to Coleman Beach. So a little longer, a little more arduous. Uh, but both good courses. We'll have plenty of safety folks on hand to, to watch the participants. Um, sponsored by the paddleboard company and friends of the Harbor Department. And again, Jesse King and his family, I'm sure they'll be here. So come on down for that. Um, starts, I believe, at 8 o'clock in the morning on this Saturday the 6th. Recent city council activity. <clears throat> uh, special council meeting on the 25th. The council um, rescinded a resolution, resolution adopted a new 
um, general fund emergency reserve and internal service reserve um, fund policy and also um, preliminary adopted a harbor accumulation fund reserve policy and tourism um, business improvement district reserve policy we've never had a reserve policy for our harbor fund we've had accumulation fund but never a policy so um, in addition to updating the existing policies um, jennifer calloway the finance director um, has got a um, reserve policy that we'll be looking at later tonight and so council approved that in the t-bid policy as well so we'll get to that one on item i want to say three c2 or c3 later also on the 25th um, the council adopted a resolution approving an interim master lease agreement between the city of morrow bay and 801 llc which is the current leaseholder at the libertine grill lease site our libertine pub lease site um, technically it's lease site 86 86w at 801 embarcadero um, that lease expired September 30th, so we have a new interim lease there in place for two years or until um, that leaseholder is intending to um, submit a project for the upper, larger Centennial Market Plaza project that the city's currently got out to Stafford and McCarty for possible redevelopment. Also on the 25th, we approved a new master lease agreement between the City of Morro Bay and um, Rose's Landing, 8725 Embarcadero, LLC, for lease site 8282W or 8285-85W, um, located at 725 Embarcadero. That was in recognition of a new project that that leaseholder is doing, which is converting the upstairs, which is currently a restaurant, to hotel use. I think he's putting in 10 or 12 hotel units. Um, his previous project was to do slips, but he's run into so many um, hurdles with eelgrass there that he's put that one aside for now and pursuing doing a hotel conversion upstairs, which will should bring in more revenue to the city, um, definitely bring in more um, sales tax and TOT than the restaurant would. So um, hopefully he'll continue on with that and get that project underway here fairly soon. Also on the 25th, uh, council on the consent calendar approved the request by Ron... Um, Reisner, Harvard Advisor Board member, did not be here tonight. That would have been his third absence, or is his third absence. Um, you get two. Um, otherwise, it's three strikes, you're out. So unless you're excused, he applied for that and was granted an excuse. I think he's back at the International Boatyard and Marina Conference is speaking in New Orleans or something. Um, so they gave him a pass on that. And I spoke earlier, we have um, approved Sea Otter Awareness Week, a proclamation declaring a 16th annual Sea Otter Awareness Week, week which was September 23rd to 29th. And on the 25th, Council provided some input and direction on updating, updating of the Harvard Department of Lease Management Policy. Any questions on any of those? Upcoming events, I talked about the Jesse King Memorial Paddle, Harbor Festival, uh, Heroes Wine Walk, it's on October 26th from 6 to 9 p.m. And I'm just going to read from the website. Um, it's the newest way to celebrate our Halloween season with our brand new Morbe Heroes Wine Walk, October 26th, 6 to 9 p.m. Um, hoping people be dressed and celebrating heroes, real fiction um, for Halloween. Um, 30 businesses, bars, pubs, restaurants, um, and others sampling wine, beer, cider, alongside lo local nibbles. Um, so along Morbay Boulevard. So there's a website for that on our staff report. You can look for that. Um, sounds like an interesting new event. Two tall ships. I'm assuming the Lady Washington and the Hawaiian Chieftain will be here again November 28th and staying through the 28th of December, or 18th of December, sorry. About 21 days. It's a pretty long stay. This year they're planning on staying at the South Tee Pier as opposed to Marina Square where they've stayed historically in the past. So look for a little change of venue there. And any questions on any of those? Okay, moving right along. Uh, status of pending HAB recommendations. I probably don't have any changes on any of those, but I'll go through them. Uh, item number one, no change. Item two, and if anybody has any questions, sing out or throw something at me. Uh, item two, no changes. Item three, boat yard, and um, do you have a staff report item on this? Yeah, so I'll give any updates I've got on that when we get to that item. Um, council did um, approve a financial feasibility study to go out for that, which I'm still currently working on. Uh, item four, cost allocation plan and the master fee schedule. Um, master fee isn't necessarily on here, but cost allocation. Next week we're meeting for our first time with the consultants that are putting together all those plans. So those will start getting underway here pretty quickly. 
I think the master fee schedule study is the first one that's going along and then uh, cost allocation will come after that because the master fee feeds into that. Item five, no new updates on that. The tax and other revenues. Item six, yield grass, that's on the agenda tonight. Item seven, working waterfront, nothing new to update. Um, our ad hoc committee provided all its input jointly with the planning commission ad hoc committee to the to the GPAC and to that whole process. So um, hopefully we'll see something come out of that once the GPLCP process winds up. And paid parking, no new updates on that. Any questions? Yeah. Um, on the, um, number eight, paid parking one. Uh, I just want to mention something. Having worked down by the, muse the Maritime Museum for the last year, but especially in the last few weeks when I was there a lot, uh, you notice people would park in the parking lot they come over to us and ask us how much does it cost to park and where where do they pay? I mean, especially foreign tourists, but a whole lot of people do. So, just want to let throw that out there. Okay, thank you. So next we go on to business items, and at this point, um, Christine Johnson is here for the presentation as the executive director of the Central Coast Aquarium number four. Would anybody object to moving her to the first place position so that she is not held over? Okay, so with that consensus, Christine, come to the dais. Hello everyone. I don't know if Mr. Anders being wants to make remarks before or do you want me just to begin? What works? I, I think you're straight into it. I think it's all just your report. Okay, great. Um, good evening. Christine Johnson, Executive Director of Central Coast Aquarium. Thank you for hosting me tonight. I'm excited to take your questions and give you information. I know there's a lot going on um, around the aquarium, the Morrow Bay Aquarium, that's just closed up. And if, if, feel free to ask me anything about what plans may be for the future in terms of how it looks for the Central Coast Aquarium and what our what our plans are and where we stand. The status update really is what I'm here to do tonight for you. So ready to take your questions. I don't know if all of you have been to Avila. Some of you know Avila quite well on this commission, but how many of you have not been to the Central Coast Aquarium in Avila? Okay, great. Well, I have just a really brief video that will show you what we've been doing there. Here's our mission. Um, Central Coast Aquarium, and you did receive some information, I think, from Mr. Endersby. We've been in this community almost 25 years. 2019, we'll celebrate our 25th year here, delivering marine science education to children. First was the goal. Our core business is still teaching students and classes about marine science education in a hands-on interactive way. And then the second thing that's evolved from that is having and operating a public exhibit hall aquarium. But the core of what we do is to cultivate a community dedicated to ocean stewardship through education, engagement, and action. And we continue to do that. So here's a video that you'll see, and we can just go ahead and hit play, and I can tell you a little bit about it. This is, um, you'll see scenes from our summer camp, as well as a group that came to the rear of the aquarium. So we have, every week of the summer, we have a camp, a day camp for students of various ages. And you'll see scenes inside the aquarium with swell sharks, and then in our touch tank. And this is out on a boat in San Luis Harbor, where they are able to, permitted, to trawl and pull things up into that little pool more touch tank. And then we have a classroom on the second floor where we do squid dissection with kids of all ages. So many of you are probably pretty familiar with squid, but many children have never seen it before. So we do programs both in our facility and else and on the water whenever we can. We try to get students out there as much as possible. We have scholarships we can offer some 
schools, but it is a more expensive program, as you might imagine, to rent the boat and to go out on the bay. So. We see about 5,000 students a year through the program, and we do that in two ways. We have them come from over six counties, depending upon the year. We'll have students come from as far away as Bakersfield and Merced, all ages. And about 60% of our students come from Santa Maria schools right now. And the majority of our students are from Title I schools. So they're coming from socioeconomic, economically disadvantaged areas. And we're able to reduce the cost of their visit, which is mostly transportation. Buses are expensive. Our program is not as expensive as the transportation, but to get them there takes a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a hike. So we're able to sometimes reduce those costs through grant writing. So now we're at the end. So that just gives you a snapshot of what we do. And that's our core work is to educate students about what's beneath the surface. It's more important to all of us that we understand uh, the importance of the ocean because we all rely on the health of our oceans for our health here, but it's really challenging for people. You all have very special relationship with water and beneath the surface, many people don't. It just looks like a big mystery to them. So as much as we can expose people to uh, the wonders of the sea and the mysteries and how important it is, that helps everyone. So we can go to the next. I think I could probably advance it. Okay. So um, I don't know if many of you knew Russ or Carol Kiesig. They are the founders of the aquarium. Russ was started out by offering classes as a volunteer on the um, Harford Pier, just out in the open, teaching anybody who wanted to come and learn about marine science. He progressed into the Old Port Inn and was on the second floor for many years. He had an MOU with the owners of the restaurant, and he worked there um, delivering programs to students, and that's when he really started to build on connections with the community and the local schools. So it's just grown from them, from there. Um, so for almost 25 years they've been doing it. Russ sadly never got to see the building that exists now in Avila. He passed away just prior to it being completed. But I just actually had coffee with his wife Carol today. But um, it was just really one person's dream and uh, it came to fruition. So as I mentioned before, we serve preschool children, kindergarten children, all the way through 12th grade. Over 5,000 students come through Avila's facility from six counties, 60% of students from Title I schools. Our public exhibit hall has been open since 2010 at the site where it is. That building was built with remediation funds that came from Unical many years ago because of the oil uh, seepage spill. So that was a, a big bonus um, to the community. Some of the things that were done with that, with those funds uh, were things like building the aquarium. So it, of course, changed the face of Avila, um, but that is where some of the funding didn't come from for the current building. This year, we're on target to have 33,000 exhibit hall visitors, members of the public. The reason that that's a big jump from 2017 is because we are now open six days a week all year long from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. except Mondays. So that's the, uh, the aquarium had odd hours in the past and they were open in the summer and on certain holidays, but members of the public here, the local population couldn't ever quite get right when they were open. People would trek to Avila and find it closed. So even though we've been open a year now, for six days we still get people who wonder, like, when are you open? So it's made a big difference. Um, you can see the numbers are, you know, 10,000 extra people have come through. And then that's my contact information. That's a brief overview of Avila. You have uh, my business card and some other flyers about what we do. And any questions about the Avila facility before we, we move into Morrow Bay? Um, who owns the Avila facility? Okay, it's we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So we do own the building and all of the facility, everything inside the building, but we do lease uh, from the county of Slow for a dollar a year is the ground lease that we have, but everything else we do with the, the organization owns that. That's a great, and we have, we're governed by um, a nine person board of directors, just like many other nonprofits. Yeah, great question. Does your facility carry any debt service currently? Debt service? No, no, we're just trying to stay in the black. Yeah, but no debt, no debt. We own our, you know, the building is, is ours, we own it, um, free and clear at this point. So that would be an asset that we do have. But it's just part of the reason, um, recently they've made some changes. I've been with the organization six months, 
I started in the middle of April, so I was doing working for another nonprofit, um, was domestic violence organization. It's October, so I can put, do a plug for that. So I was working for Stand Strong, and then this opportunity had happened in Evelyn. I thought it was interesting, so I made the switch to come there. And right before I came, they realized that they really did need to revisit their business model. So that was finally the decision that caused them to open. They said, you know, we have to do the six day a week or six days a year open. So that's really changed a lot for the organization in this year. And then the other thing they did is they were a little top heavy with staff, so they did eliminate a full time position. So. I'm a new uh, executive director. My compensation is not what the previous person was. She had been there for five years, and there are other things that, um, you know, I'm a little bit more reasonable. But in general, though, I think it's being open six days a week, and then also just, um, you know, re realigning what's really necessary to operate. We have three full time staff at this point and four part time staff. And ideally, our model is to move more toward volunteers who are in the exhibit hall, work with the school programs, and run our gift shop. Um, because that really is a model that you see if you go to the, uh, the State Park Natural History Museum that is virtually run by docents entirely. So there is a model that is possible. We do have so many qualified, talented, and engaging people in our community. We're fortunate we have Cal Poly students, Cuesta students, and Hancock students that come. They're wonderful. They're enthusiastic. As you know, the WOW kids were um, coming. They did some community service for us. They're just incredible, but they're a little bit transient. So we're always looking for more residents who can brave the parking in Avila, know all the secret parking spots, because people do, you know, they are concerned about, oh, I won't find parking if I have to volunteer on a Saturday or Sunday. Um, but we can tell you the secret spots for that. But yeah, so we're working this year, 2017. Um, we have an extension on our taxes with the transition in leadership. So we're hoping it be definitely in the black this year for 17 and certainly for 18. So, yes. Christine, then. what are the charges for uh, going through the museum? Or okay. Various it's $8 for um, a regular general admission, $5 for seniors, military, and then children under two are free. What we encourage locals to do is for $80, you can buy a year membership, and then you have unlimited visits. So that's really the way to do it, especially if you have smaller children or people who, who grandchildren are out, are out of town. And we have multiple feedings of all of our animals different times of the day, so you can come and go whenever you like. But you're, if you pay, um, let's say at 10 o'clock you come in and you pay $8, but you really want to see them see them feed the giant Pacific octopus, and we're not doing that until 12 o'clock, then you just can come back in. People have unlimited access the day they purchase. So, And we haven't raised the admission fees in quite a while, but we did raise the membership a little bit. Yeah. All right. Dana. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, sure. As far as your income, uh, is it all just from the fees people coming in I mean is there a certain amount of uh, donations or funding or grants that I mean trying mm -hmm. to look at a pie chart of how this right, uh, right how it's all funded right we really are seeking diverse sources we do have diverse sources there are many funders that um, fund children's programs school children's programs so we do have connections locally and uh, more regionally with those funders so we do a lot of grant writing uh, the, co the uh, community foundations been very generous to us the slow community foundation a little different than the one that's at the Estero Bay um, we there so we do have a great deal of grant fund writing um, we have an annual event catch of the Central Coast which we just had on September 8th and that makes us of this year, we net about $45,000 for one evening, which isn't too bad, with about 165 people, so we're grateful. Um, sponsorships also, you know, people like PG&E and the banks are very generous. So that's, a, that's, that's the way we augment. Um, the, oh, our gift shop is actually a, a, another revenue source for us. So it takes all of those together to fund it, because as you know, we have 50 different individual species of animals and 250 individual animals, give and take. And that's 24-hour care every single day of the year. And for example, it's been really warm this summer, more than usual in Avila, I think. And we've, especially around the 4th of July, we really had a hard time keeping our water temperature low. So, you know, at some point we may have to invest, invest in air conditioning, which we don't have, but it just, you know, depends on how the temperature goes. So every time we're adjusting things, our electricity bill is actually pretty high. So this past month it was $2,300 just for 
you know, power, but we can never turn anything off, right? So you're constantly uh, moving things through. And the animal, you know, animals themselves, you know, when you have something that's living that's in your care, you really have to be responsible. So a year ago, they put in $50,000 worth of life support system so that if something does happen, that you know, everything, the pumps will keep moving and the water will still be fresh for the animals until we can figure it out. And then we just recently did have to have some replacement to our generator. It had kind of burned out a little bit. So, it, you know, we found a leak in the jelly tank last week. So it's just, you know, ongoing maintenance of things like that. But it's a pretty large operation. And um, we have one woman, she's 26, and she's the director of uh, husbandry. And she knows all about our animals and she knows all about how to make things run. And she's a really pretty, incredible person. So. Yeah. What is the size of your facility uh, in Avila? Okay. Uh, and how does that compare to with the size of the facility you're looking to possibly produce here? Okay. So Avila is, you know, gosh, the square footage is comparable to what um, we would be doing on the same footprint here on the Embarcadero in Morro Bay. So it's a two-story facility. It's a two-room aquarium. And then we have a room for a gift shop and then a little anti-space. And then the outdoor area kind of segues into the back of the house where we have all of the, the mechanisms for keeping things going. And then the second floor has a classroom space, a very small administrative office, and then restrooms. So square footage, I want to say, hmm, I can get that to you. I should have that off the top of my head, but I actually don't. But it wouldn't be... It's a, it would be comparable in size to what you have here in the current Morro Bay Aquarium, so with, with the two floors, but utilizing both floors for the programs, where I think in Morro Bay, it was just the first floor that was utilized. Additionally, we've just expanded a project, um, Ocean Discovery Park. There was just an empty lot that was part of the property that the aquarium had. Over the last several years, they have expanded and enclosed a patio out there. It makes it a lot easier to do certain kinds of programs where the water can just, you know, we can set up the tanks. You probably saw the plankton activity, which is, you know, big tanks full of water, and you do it over and over again. So we wouldn't to set up outside much easier. But also, as you might know, there are a lot of people come through. It's a destination, a wedding destination, our county in general. So we were hoping that when we're not using it for school programs or other activities, which are virtually almost all during the day, we could maybe diversify our revenue and use it as an event space too. So we've talked to the Avila Beach um, Golf Resort, which is kind of right across the street. You know, they have all the big concerts. They're under a lot of pressure by the Avila community because it's just really intense parking issues when their events begin. So we're working on partnerships with maybe they would have a VIP event that would start a few hours earlier. They would have it at the outdoor patio. So people would park kind of gradually. Um, and then also maybe we have already for next year, next September, we have a wedding rehearsal booked for the outdoor space. Because it's quirky. Have cocktails inside with the animals and then they'll set up under lights and you know a tent or not a tent, whichever they choose. And then they'll, they want to rent that space because it really is a beautiful place. And they're already getting married at someplace else in Avila. So there are a lot of opportunities for that event space. And you'll see a lot of nonprofits have gone to that to just diversify their, their revenue stream. OK, great. Oh, more. I have more. Yeah, I have yeah, more. yeah I can't, well, you all have to come visit me, but you have to let me know when you're coming, so get a private tour. Um, so would this kind of be the same scenario here? Would you have uh, space that could be used for events or a conference room or something like that that could help augment some of your uh, costs? Yes, exactly. Well, to give you an example, so roughly speaking, 200,000 people come through Avila as visitors a year. Comparable numbers here, rough numbers. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to quote me exactly. Are about eight hundred thousand plus a year. So the traffic walking by is very different in each location. But the site would be more or less. You know, it would be similar in terms of the exhibits. We wouldn't be like doubling the exhibits. Um, but the opportunity here in Morro Bay would be the second story. We would work potentially, and we can go into this a little bit too. The idea is that we would work collabor collaboratively with uh, Cal Poly to see what kind of space they would need up there, knowing that we would all, including they would, want to use it for events as if we could. And truly, that is a unique location because the view from there is, you know, spectacular. Versus, you know, in Avila it's very pretty, but you're, you know, you're outside and you're on one level. But having the second story uh, would definitely be something that the, and we could work out partnerships, and you know, certain organizations could use it, and then we could rent it to the public. So, yeah, would be those things are would or would be what's possible. So I do have the 
the information you have, which is just a concept of a, moral, a proposed Morro Bay Aquarium and Marine Science Education Facility. I do have that on the screen. If you wanted us to pull that up to follow through, I have it in front of me. Would it make it easier if we saw it up there? Maybe. And I do might need some assistance to get that. Right, okay, great. Let's, let me just check. I think I might, I just do a little switching. That's already on. That was able to be transferred. So that should be right now. I think I should be able to. Oh. Okay, great, so we're working on getting that full screen. It's pretty tiny, I'm sure, for folks watching from home. Maybe even for me, so I have my glasses, but. Yeah, so what this is, is, um, and I shared this, I had closed session meeting with the city council in September, uh, talking about the way forward and where, with the status update, same as, as here, so I was able to share this with them. And it's just an initial concept plan for the proposed aquarium, this is, I really want to be clear and, and say that this is these are a vision. This is a night. These are ideas. These are things that we think might work. But as you all know, with plans and partnerships, um, it definitely is subject to change. But I think it's really helpful and beneficial to have something on paper that we can all look at and say this sounds like something I'm interested in, or maybe not. This also helps. Um, it, it helps talk about what Avila can bring to the project and then what the benefits to the city of Morro Bay would be, especially to current residents. So the overview begins with the history of the aquarium, but I want to talk about, I've talked to you about the history a little bit of Avila, but I want to talk to you about where we stand right this minute with Morro Bay. So several years ago, as you know, and I this is um, in the overview as well, that there was an RFP process to go out um, for the site. And the decision ultimately was made at the time to pursue a partnership with the Central Coast Aquarium for them to expand their operations and their mission into Morro Bay. Since that time, the city worked with the nonprofit to come up with a consent of landowner agreement. Then there was, there was change here in city leadership Ultimately, there was change in the leadership of the Central Coast Aquarium. Although the board has stayed very consistent, the executive director had gone. And there was, I think we were a bit stuck in forward momentum on raising the $44,000 needed for a economic feasibility study. The one thing, though, that Central Coast Aquarium was able to pursue would be ultimate funding for a project. And they were able to pursue, pursue an avenue through the USDA, which, as you probably know, built the Morro Bay Fire Station as well was the funding source for that project. Uh, so uh, that is, I, I want to caution us and say we're not pre-approved, okay, for a loan, but we are eligible to apply. So a project like this is eligible for funding through the USDA process. And the reason is because we're a rural community and it's looked at as rural economic development. So because we're 20,000 people or less, we have the possibility for this money. Someone asked me, well, it's federal money. How secure is it in the way, you know, our you know, there's shifts in every administration, four years or eight years, priorities change. How sure are we that that money is going to be there? And the benefit of the USDA loan program is the fact that it's a loan and that loan programs are much more favored by at both sides of the aisle than a grant program where the money is given away and then who knows whatever happens to it. But this would be a, a clearly we'd have to be paying back the loan. So those funds have stayed very consistent. We've had a really great contact with the USDA and you know she's explained that if this program is just usually um, supported by both sides of the aisle and it's just been very consistent funding for communities. So 
that's something good to know. So in the meantime, I came in in April and we had about $10,000 of the money raised. The first, well, let me back up. So in order to apply for the USDA funds, you must do three things. An economic feasibility study, you have to get through your project plan, and you have to have your CEQA and NEPA. So basically, economic development, uh, we start with feasibility and then go all the way through to the permitting process. And then you can apply for the loan. So it's quite a process where it's not like it's going to happen today or yesterday or tomorrow. So where we are is we decided to start with the economic feasibility project or study because um, you know, we're a small nonprofit, so we want to make sure that this is something that we can manage at the end of the day. The city has given $10,000 to the Economic Feasibility Study in 2017 as part of their efforts for economic development. So we were missing, you know, the $34,000. It was a total project of $44,000 to hire the consultant. The consultant's name is Consult Econ. They're in this document. They specialize in, really, they're, they're the the proponent for the nonprofit. They specialize in zoos, aquariums, nature centers, museums, things like this, uh, to make sure that the projects are feasible and that nobody loses their shirts on that. So they have been affiliated with the program for about four or five years. Finally, we were able to raise the money um, to start phase A. So we started phase A. We raised the, enough money for that and began that the first week of July. The consultant was here the first week of August, stayed and visited Morro Bay and Avila, and they're ongoing right now studying the tourism numbers and other, other factors that would make it viable or not. Um, as of September, we raised the balance of the money, so the $44,000 has now been raised, and we're in the middle of finishing the study, and we should have results hopefully by the end of October, middle of November, so then we'll know what the feasibility is for this facility and what the partnerships could look like we're even counting on them doing things like what we would charge for admission and what the staffing would be like, things like that. How it would balance out with the Avila property. So we're waiting the results of the feasibility study before we do anything moving forward. The city understands that. That was part of what we discussed in closed session too with that lease negotiation. So we haven't taken over the lease. Um, the, the lease is reverted back to the city just because we're in the situation where we don't know what, which exactly um, how the, the project will go forward. So we're in a little tiny bit of a, a, waiting, a waiting time brief. Um, and then once we find that out, then we'll be able to make us and take some steps as to do we want to be in the building in a small way, um, because then we'll be launching if it is possible, if we all agree it's feasible and we should move forward, then we'll be going into the development phase of developing the plan, what it would look like, what the design would be like inside. And then that's when we would start that process. So we'd be fundraising also for that, and that's another thirty or $34,000 estimated to get that plan done at this point. So that's at least progress in the last six months to get some answers. Yeah. So from my understanding of this project, it, you're looking at multiples of millions of dollars in terms of its development. And to date, you've raised 44000 mm -hmm. towards yeah, it? For the study. Mm -hmm. And do you have fundraising plans beyond that to take this forward in terms of funding it to fruition, or right? So, you the the understanding is that the loan could be up to a twenty million dollar loan, which is a lot of money. I don't know if it would take twenty, but I would assume it would take ten because we're talking about likely a tear down and a complete remodel, and that would be expanding the Harbor Walk in front. It would be. Um, maybe it would have a public restroom component, as you know, that would have to be built in. So it's an extensive project, certainly, for the waterfront to have to have that. So in, as you know, things sound like they're going to be 10 million. Next thing you know, they're 11 or 12. So the plan would be the feasibility study will say whether or not this project can move forward with the current revenue streams that would be coming from the um, Central Coast Aquarium. So in other words, Ultimately, can the two facilities running together pay back a loan in the meantime? So that that will be what we want to know. Everyone wants to know if it's possible for a small nonprofit to run this, this entity. 
we are estimating that twenty thousand, sorry, two hundred thousand dollars would get us through the entire development process to the point where that we would then apply for the loan. Any funds we raise, however, would decrease the amount that we have to borrow. So if it's feasible, we would then launch a larger, different kind of fundraising campaign where we would see, could we find the million dollar donor or the two million dollar donor, knowing that it would only reduce the bottom line ultimately. But when the board of the Central Coast Aquarium and the city leadership at the time decided they were moving forward, it was the idea that the loan would be paid back really at the full amount, which is daunting when you think about it. So. The real, the, but the real, the realization that there are capital campaigns already going on in the county. You have the Museum of Art trying to raise money. You have the the Little Theater, slow rep. You know they're trying to raise money for a capital campaign. So that's what it would be. It would be a large capital campaign fundraising. But we're really waiting to see what the feasibility study is first. But unfortunately, we don't have a donor that has already said I'm committed to five million if it moves forward. It doesn't mean we wouldn't have that donor. That donor could be there. It could be there through many connections that we just haven't tapped into, or because the project has seemed kind of dead in the water, people have just said, no, it's never going to happen. So I think having the feasibility study is what will help drive you know, any future fundraising as well, because it looks like it can actually happen. That, that's a great question. That's what we all want to find out, right? Dana? Well, I just was wondering Cal Poly's uh, part in all of this. Uh, yeah. So Dean went, um, who I think many of you are familiar with, through his work here in the city of Morro Bay with the fisheries. So he's now dean of um, the College of Math Mathematics and Science at Cal Poly, and he's been on, this, on the Central Coast Aquarium Board for three years, and he just has a renewed term for three more years on the board. So it's good that we have that close connection with someone who understands our organization, understands Morro Bay, understands Cal Poly, so it's really it's advantageous for us. And what his response has been, let's get feasibility done and then Cal Poly will really be able to come to the table and say what it is that they want to do. So everyone who works at the Cal Poly Pier, I don't know if you know those folks there, they're very enthusiastic about it. Um, of course, on, on the surface, it's in a wonderful combination, right? The city of Morro Bay, Cal Poly, and Central Coast Aquarium, the three entities working together. You know, for Cal Poly, they've had their marine science education, they've had their marine science major a few years. This would really bolster a lot of their work. They're already doing a lot of research, as you know, in the bay and the ocean. This lease site has two um, water leases that come with it. So that would be another docking opportunity. I mean, now for their, they're investing in a big dock down below, redoing their dock at the Cal Poly Pier in Avila, because it's you know, kind of falling apart, but it's not the same as walking right out on the pier in Morro Bay, getting in the boat and going, right? It's much more of an effort to get out there. So there's so many opportunities, but without the feasibility study, no one really can say whether or not they're in or out. And that makes sense. Okay. Um, the loan for the Avila building, when, when it was built, was it paid for already? Did you have a loan? How much did it cost and how long did it take to get to owning it completely? Right, so the money, the last part of the challenge with um, the finances are for a very long time they had remediation money. It went from, I think, and this, this I'm learning this history because I didn't live through it, but and you know, many of you may even know that when the money, the mitigation money came for you know the cleanup of the oil, um, ultimately was coming. It went then to Fish and Wildlife was the depository for the funds. So for every year, for many many years, the Central Coast Aquarium was recipient of generous funds from that pot of money. Right. So it's really hard to wean yourself off that money and say, oh, for a rainy day, we're going to put some, you know, in in like. Reserve, right? The city has a hard time doing it too sometimes. So that money was very consistent for a long time. Interestingly, I don't know if you all even remembered Prop 68 that was just on our June ballot. The the uh, all right, the California Coastal Conservancy was one of the beneficiaries of that of that pass the passing that those funds. So years ago, the Coastal Conservancy. The Central Coast Aquarium applied for a grant. It was fifty thousand dollars at the time, you know, many years ago, that paid for all of the permitting fees to get it through the process. So, believe it or not, the same employee is there 
now that was there then. And when he and I had preliminary discussions about some other things in Avila, they just sent us, they augmented their, their amount of money they gave to us for um, our student programs. They ended up asking us, do you want $7,000 more? Because there is a pot of money there. Um, and then he said, well, what about Morro Bay? When you get to that point, let's talk because there's an opportunity for us to do the same thing. So those funds were applied in Avila. The not having to pay for the land, right, was through a process. The county gave the land to the community services district, who is actually now the, the you know, the landlord for the property. So that was all done deliberately, and then it was done with a one dollar year lease, which is just the way it was back then. This may not be the same here. It's perfectly fine to discuss that. Um, so that's the result. So then I think in that amount of time, the original building was about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So that's back in. But there's no waterfront there, right? Um, so that development was pretty straightforward. It was not built originally as a public aquarium. It was adapted. It was to be a school site visit place where all they did was have kids come in school program after school program after school program. They adapted it later and then went in and put in the exhibits, which makes it difficult now, which is why it's not AZA accredited. We talked about that a lot. Um, let's see, Association, American Zoology Association, like, uh, something, everyone calls it AZA, but it is the accreditation, Tascadero Zoo is actually AZA accredited. Um, the hope would be any Morro Bay facility would be too, but you almost have to do it from the beginning. Because simple things like we only have one sink for animal prep and any human use. So, you know, we keep it very clean, but the idea is that wouldn't be allowed in AZA. So Avila is not AZA. And certain way the exhibits were done and the piping was done, these are the details that, because it was adapted later for the public use, uh, keep it from being AZA accredited. So, yeah, so the public exhibit hall came in 2010, but the building itself opened in 2006. Can you recap what you envision as your timeline now that you're into the uh, point of uh, a feasibility study and then you're saying that design and plans, et cetera, and then mm -hmm. application, well, then the uh, environmental, and then application at that point, and then, of course, going through the loan process with the federal government right. to where you would, you know, where you could say that this is where I would expect us to be able to break ground? I would say... If the feasibility study comes back strong and everyone supports the way forward, uh, we would launch immediately into more of a serious fundraising campaign to, we'll immediately have the, about, I think it's $34,000 was the estimate to get us through the development process, plus a little bit more for CEQA and NEPA. So we're really talking about $100,000. We'd try to fundraise for that immediately. And if all goes well, aggressively from this point forward, or let's say December forward, 18 months to get through approvals to two years to get all the approvals we need. That includes going to Planning Commission here, going to Council here, and going to Coastal Commission. So I think if all goes well, it could be two years. Depends upon that process and, and how fortunate we are um, in terms of you know fundraising and keeping momentum in the project. So there are it was a very quiet fundraising campaign to raise the $34,000 that was raised in addition to the $10,000 the city put in. So it was um, $10,000 from the city, $4,000 from the county. Two of the county commissioners gave $2,000 each of their discretionary funds. It was Supervisor Gibson and Supervisor Hill, because we sit in both of their communities. So that was $14,000 from government. And then the rest of it was raised, the other $30,000 was raised by 48 different individuals. So, you know, that really is a very small you know, fundraising campaign. It was just really word of mouth and say, you know, people who are, are interested. And what really made it, I think, um, a, a risk worth taking for folks was for $250, you could donate that. And you it's a donation to a nonprofit. So it's still, we're a 501c3. You write it to Central Coast Aquarium. It's earmarked for Morro Bay feasibility. And if there is ever a building with a wall, your name will be prominently displayed as a Visionary Circle member because it is a bit of a risk. But at the low entrance of $250, people said, OK, sure. You know, I'd like to see it, sure. Now, some people gave more. 
but we were able to raise thirty thousand dollars in that way in about you know three months to get to what we needed to get to for the feasibility study. We wouldn't be able to do the next phase, you know, in that quiet way. We'd have to be much more organized and we'd be more targeted. A few people with businesses on the Embarcadero donated to that. Maybe they didn't really know what was happening, but ultimately we haven't gone to Tiva, we haven't gone to hoteliers, we haven't gone to everyone to see, you know, would you like this here? Would it would it help your business to have, you know, a destination like an aquarium? We've had an aquarium here for many years and it has helped the businesses that are right around it. And, and then further down the Embarcadero. So it is going to be a loss not having that facility, not having that visitor destination. So those are the kinds of things we would do, step forward. So two years would be, you know, it's a dream. But I'll just say two, reasonably three. But then, you know, think about the Maritime Museum. It was there, you know, it was a dream and a dream and a dream, and then all of a sudden the right people came together, and it happened. So it's a good example in some ways. Okay, uh, as far as you said that it's still up in the air, if it's going to be a dollar for a year, um, in the feasibility study, did they look into any of those aspects of the costs affiliated um, and then being variable? Right. At the so no negotiation has taken place with the city about the specifics of the lease at all. So the negotiation, the closed session, um, was just a touching base, letting them know where we were with the feasibility study, and really my, um, well, the hope that we could hold off on the Central Coast Aquarium assuming the loan until we were able to get to the end of the feasibility. I think that seemed reasonable, but because it was eminently closing, uh, we needed to figure out what we were going to do. You know, with the with the existing aquarium closing at the end of September, we all needed to touch base and say, okay, you know, where are we headed? So, to be clear, we haven't done any lease negotiation at all. The one dollar a year lease was a remark that was made about two years ago. Um, that was just, oh, and we'll give them a, two, a dollar a year lease, but. Clearly, the only documentation we had was the consent of landowner, which then the city had to be flexible on the deadlines because the Central Coast Aquarium was, they were focusing on getting the USDA connection and probably weren't doing some of the fundraising they needed for the feasibility study. There was just a little bit of a disconnect. So that's why there was some shift in the deadlines. But the city is, and maybe Eric really can address some of that, but there would be anything's possible when you negotiate, right? But I, I know that the feasibility study will specifically talk about that kind of a benefit and what what would, it, just they're going to lay out the options. So I think there would be multiple options they would come back with in terms of um, the lease. So if there's a two year lag minimum that you're envisioning, what would you envision as being the current site and would it lay fallow or would you be operating it in some manner? Um, what is your thoughts to that? So our plan that we did, Eric and I have been talking pretty regularly about what this very thing, so our short term plan would be to get in there as soon as possible to use the front area, the gift shop area. Um, unfortunately, as you may imagine, Time moves on, and the systems that um, were in place for the animals that were there, they are not compatible with the way we're doing things now in Avila, so we aren't able to transition and say, oh, well, we'll just put different animals in these tanks and we'll run it. As you know, there won't be mammals, there won't be marine mammals coming back um, in any future aquarium that the Central Coast Aquarium would be proposing. So that portion would be unused. And then the tank system, we're working with the city to sort of figure out, you know, it was a genius, really, operation that I just don't think anybody can replicate the way things have been um, managed or just, it's just brilliant the way they've been able to pull it together. It's not a system that my staff can walk into and operate. It's a little bit different. So we are hoping to get into the front of the building. We have two mobile touch tanks that um, we can bring um, touch tank type exhibits, so invertebrates, all the things you saw the kids touching, we're able to bring those things in and rotate them out from Avila. The touch tank is itself, you plug it in and it operates, and then we'd have a small gift shop. All of those proceeds would go toward the project. We would not charge admission. It would be free to come in and you know interact with the touch tank, talk about the, pro talk about the project, 
great opportunity for us to explain what we're doing. Right now, if it were to start tomorrow, we would be open on weekends because we're in that shoulder season. So not as busy perhaps as the summer, but we would clearly put things on the windows, talking about coming soon, what's happening, information, where to go for more information, so we'd make it look as lively and as active as possible. I've also talked to the um, Morro Bay National Estuary Program, as well as some of the businesses that have the paddle boards and kayaks, and we could start doing programs, so we could run a program, so we could work with one of the boat pro the tour boat providers, we could charge a small amount, but go toward the Morro Bay Project, put one of our docents on the boat, go out into the bay, go to the sand spit, do the things that we do with students, but use those programs for the general public and start operating kind of without walls. So I did talk to uh, Lexi Bell about that. We could start and end a program like that up in there. They had that small exhibit area, but it's on the second floor. It's hard for them to get people up there. We could go up there, start the tour there, then have people down, do the activities actually on the bay, and then you know kind of wrap up like that. So that, again, would be something we'd have to advertise on the front of the building and have a consistent schedule. So those are things we can do right away um, to, to at least have some life down there in the corner, but then ultimately when the when the construction process comes, and that would just be, you know, that would be it. But we want to use that space as much as we possibly can. We're just unable to really do it to have consistent tanks that we'd have to do it with the with the touch tank. Yeah, I think that's great that if you could get in there and cover up the big holes where the signs used to be just to kind of help soften that whole absence and at the same time promote your new aquarium I think that's the sooner the better yeah. is the interim portion of the uh, operations that you're talking about and discussing now part of your feasibility study in terms of the ongoing going forward plans you know we didn't talk about that for feasibility because that's pretty short term but we were able to run some numbers internally and our, we know how much it would cost to you know, have somebody actually pack up the animals, bring them down, take them back out on Sunday. You know, we've figured that we'll be paying utilities to use whatever you know, electricity we have in there. Um, so we were able, and then we're working on a budget now. What would be our investment? Um, we have a donor who actually said that they would help us with our initial investment to get a very small gift shop up and running. And I've had great conversations with people who have businesses on the gift shop, or the gift shops on the Embarcadero. I haven't talked to everyone, but I've talked to several. And we're hoping to do branded things. It would be like Central Coast Aquarium coming soon, Morro Bay, and not as much as possible not replicate what's already there. So, of course, there are things that sell really well for everyone, but we're researching what's there now and trying as much as possible not to replicate. But if you come and see our gift shop in Avila, you know, it's, who doesn't love a stuffed mermaid? Everyone. And we have tridents, so it's where stuffed tridents as well. <laughs> but, okay, yeah, I may ask so. one question and, uh, on a different part of this. Is there any danger to the water lease? now that the aquarium is no longer running. Do you have a water lease that allows the water to be used and then again discharged? I think, uh, you know... Um, huh? A permit? All right. There is, right, no, there is no permit. It. There never was. There may have been one decades ago, but there is no water permit for that. Do they need one? No? Depends who you ask at the water board. That's definitely in our list of things to investigate. But just so you know, currently, the way the system operates in Avila, we have a closed aquarium system. So we are able, to, through a partnership with Cal Poly, to take our water truck out to the pier, fill it up. We have two holding tanks that we fill up with the water, and then that runs through our system. So it is a closed system right now. So you can have an aquarium. I mean, they have aquariums in Iowa, right? So there are ways to have aquariums where you don't have the intake. Um, but it may be advantageous to us to have the intake. That's something we're researching with people in Monterey and Santa Barbara and other areas because it may be that that is more challenging for the discharge portion of it. So that's something that has to be investigated moving forward. But there hasn't there's there's not a there's not a historical pathway we can we can follow. But that's such a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, as far as the interim lease goes, you said that you were going to be closed for a good portion of it and just open on Saturday, Sundays. Um, 
one question as far as like the gift shop because uh, other places, subleases and, and master lease holders are, are accountable for a certain amount of time being open. Um, they have a percentage that they have to pay um, towards uh, the harbor um, department to, for maintenance. Are in this interim lease, because you're communicating it about it right now, is that because it's not necessarily used for teaching, which I would assume would be a little bit more on the nonprofit side, not needing a percentage. But if you're doing just you know gifts that are similar to next door neighbors and all up and down that are have to increase their prices based on the fact that they have to pay rent and a percentage to the city, are you um, expecting any kind of discount on that for that period of time? So I think what's really important to talk about, and it's a great question, is that ultimately the project that will be on the waterfront, if it is a public aquarium and marine science education center, is very different than the other businesses that are there initially. They're, they're, while it's operating like a business, it's important that it does. Um, clearly there are things that it could be considered something that the community wants and that the city would like to ha see here so that having a destination that draws people into Morro Bay would then ultimately benefit everyone on the Embarcadero, in town, North Morro Bay, everywhere. So there is that idea that if you invest in something like a nonprofit organization that brings a specific um, educational purpose and reason for sticking around. Maybe you know we go from a one and a half day visit to a two day visit because we've got something interesting or we have activities going all year. That is something that other communities have decided is worth it to negotiate specifically a lease with that kind of entity that's a little different from their other leases. That's been done in other areas. Will that be done here? You know, I don't know. Um, it's a great question and that's exactly the kind of discussions that will have to be held. As you know, you know, having a lease, you know how those discussions go and we'll have those same discussions and there'll be the same kind of um, pressure on everybody to try and to try and succeed there and then to try and to try and bring the vision of a remodeled state-of-the-art aquarium to the Embarcadero it's definitely a challenge and it's but it would be a challenge if someone let's say we pulled out and we didn't want to do it it would be a challenge for anybody coming in and taking that lease site and converting it to you know retail and hotel use too so it's it's a good question and we should definitely have an open discussion about that with the council and we, and we you know that's the kind of thing that we'll be talking about but right now in the short term um, it's do we want to have this this kind of um, you know, do we want to have this kind of center here? Do we, want, do we want this opportunity? And what are the side benefits to having it? And it may be that the city decides, eh, you know, not really. And then, you know, that's okay too. We're just investigating it because it's been something that's kind of been hanging out there for so long. We just kind of want to resolve it. Right. Um, as far as a nonprofit, just wondering for my own information, are uh, sales tax affiliated with retail goods that you sell? We do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I just say, and we don't get a discount for purchasing anything either. We pay. <laughs> this that doesn't work that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. <gasps> sure. Thank you all. Nice and then to you. please, yeah. Thank you. So follow up if you have any additional questions. And thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay. Let's go on to our next business item, and that'll be marine services, our boatyard, Dana. First, uh, public comment on this item, if there is any. Seeing none, we can uh, discuss the item, Dana. Okay. Um, just two things I wanted to talk about. Uh, part of the marine facility is, is boat storage, and I know the Harbor Department is working on getting bids for the fencing, and, and also there is a waiting list in the harbor department so it's not an advertised facility yet because it's not there yet but uh, this is a chance for locals to get in there and get their name on the list so that's there um, <clears throat> also regarding the uh, feasibility study the RFP for the feasibility study uh, Ron and I uh, met with Eric uh, on the 18th of September um, just to kind of go over format and, and uh, Eric's idea and then the draft that he has and uh, he's working away on that so we look forward to seeing that and so that it can come back out 
Other than that, uh, we don't have anything else to report at this time. Our next item is an update from the Finance and Budget Committee. Mark? I had a very productive meeting with staff and uh, enjoyed that time getting some uh, history and some education as to the inner workings and what challenges they face currently. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled for the subcommittee next week, uh, which we will therefore be able to come back with a much more substantive report. on <laughs> just leave it on yeah <laughs> just leave <laughs> sure so um, the second part of this staff report this item tonight is um, consideration of a um, proposed harbor accumulation fund reserve policy as I spoke earlier in the status report council updated our general fund um, reserve policies and a few other documents and adopted a new Harbor Fund Emergency Reserve Policy, um, which is a work in progress for a while. One of the components of it coming is coming to the Harbor Advisory Board. Um, GFOA, the General Government Finance Officers Association, um, provides guidelines and recommendations on how funds should maintain reserve balances. The city's general fund has a reserve balance of uh, some funny number, 24.7% or something, then we have an emergency reserve. So um, the general fund's always had a reserve. Harbor Fund, we've had a reserve. It's called our accumulation fund, but we've never really stipulated it as such, and we've never set aside part of it as an emergency reserve or, or a minimum reserve. It's always just been our accumulation fund. So um, good financial practice says you really should have a, a designated reserve with a number and a, a level you try and reach and a policy to get there and maintain it. So. Um, the minimum recommended level is 15% of ongoing annual expenditures with a target level of 25% based on our current budget, our current FY18-19 budget. Um, those numbers would be to about 250000 for the 15% level and 417000 for the 25% level. Currently, right now, in our accumulation fund, and this is not a number that has last year's excess, we did... Um, generate excess revenues over expenses last year. We just don't know the number yet because the books haven't finally settled. Um, but before the last year's settling, um, we had $340,000 in our accumulation fund. So um, if we were to suddenly decide today, oh, we want 250 as a reserve, we would have less than $100,000 left. So, and as you know, we've got a lot of projects on the, on the books, including some underway right now. So um, we adopted this policy knowing that we're not going to get there in one day or one year. Um, I've got the draft policy and the staff report from um, the finance director's council presentation a couple of weeks ago. Um, what we're looking for is Harbor Advisory Board input on the policy itself, um, just the policy document itself, and any input the, the HAB may have on that. Um, second part of that, item B, is reserve target levels. Are they appropriate? Again, 15 and 25% seem to be the range that the GFOA recommends. Um, and then um, how to re achieve those uh, target levels over time. As I spoke, we've, um, you know, we've got the money there that we could put aside for 15%, but that's going to be it. We're pretty well done. Um, so we're going to have to figure out a plan to get there. The policy as it stands now proposes a three-year plan to reach the minimum funding levels. And then how do we maintain those reserve target levels? I, th I think obviously a, a big component of maintaining well, and getting there as well is things that we've been working on over the last couple of years is um, new and increased revenue sources. Um, so hopefully those sort of things will come to fruition over time and we'll, we'll get more revenues. So with that, again, the, the, um, the Harbor Accumulation Fund Reserve Policy is in your packet. Um, draft policy, the council looked at it. Um, we um, Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I had something more to add there, but um, it's really the policy document itself that's the um, sort of the main driver here. So if you want to take it bit by bit, um, any comments on the policy itself, the document itself? Mark. 
uh, what is the triggering point to where you would dip into those funds? Repeat that, please. What would be a, 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 a an event that would occur that would cause you to dip into those funds? In other words, utilize those funds for ongoing operations. Oh, so a reserve fund is typically used in economic downturn times. That's it, one of its primary reasons for being is if, if revenues for some reason um, dip dramatically and um, you need to dip into reserves to get to them. That's where you have the policy and, and minimum levels set. And also for major emergencies, things that come up, you know, out of the blue, natural disasters and things like that. Following up, is there, a, within the policy, is there a percentage, a number, anything that causes a, a that's, you know, an objective versus a subjective decision to uh, dip into those funds? In the policy document itself as it stands now? Is that your question? Correct. Um, it's, it's what's called an unrestricted, undesignated um, fund, meaning you can use it for everything, but um, as it stands now, um, as I said, the, the two primary reasons are economic downturns. If you, you know, we're, we're still obviously going to use our accumulation fund for the big capital projects, but we'll have a set aside to that, which will be the reserve policy that we aim to not touch um, unless we need to use it. And again, it's, it's generally when you can't meet expenses with existing revenues, preferably or hopefully for a short period of time, or a major disaster. So if, you know, if something catastrophic occurred that either insurance didn't cover or, or natural disaster or something that we need to dip into that, you wouldn't go necessarily into the accumulation fund. You'd go into the reserve fund because that's more what it's intended for. Um, I have a question that's on this uh, page 20 of 24. In calculating the minimum target funding level, one-time expenditures are not considered in the base for determining operating expenditures. Correct. So that would be a, a one-time expenditure if you were doing boat maintenance that would only occur or boat repair perhaps only occur every five years would that be a one-time expenditure no those things are generally in our operating budget um, and we'll adjust our operating budget if we know oh next year the engines need to be rebuilt although that's a pretty significant item um, particularly with our boats every once in a while we'll see a big bump coming maybe a new out drive or something a little more significant but not necessarily a, a whole engine or something so Things like that will we'll work into our operating budget when we see it coming. Um, but no, typically the, the big one-time purchases are more bigger things like boats and vehicles and large things that you don't normally budget for every single year. Uh, a fire on a T-pier would be? Fire on a T-pier would be a good example for dipping into that reserve, yes. Okay. Something you didn't plan for. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this? Any comments? Uh. And kind of the, the bottom of, so the policy document is two pages. The bottom of the first page um, kind of sums up the, the need for it is, um, the Harmony Accumulation Fund Reserve will maintain sufficient cash accumulation to minimize user fee increases and departmental expenditure freezes due to market volatility, economic impacts on demands, contingencies, and regulatory changes. So that really speaks to sort of the unforeseen, not planned for type of events. I mean, economic impacts can be seen. I mean, sometimes, uh, well, hopefully they are seen. Economic downturns are generally forecast, and hopefully you can plan for those. Um, but not always, and not necessarily the, to the level that they might affect you. So what you're wanting from us is uh, any other comments or things? Yeah, if you've got any other comments in general on the on the policy itself, you think any changes need to be made? 
or adds or subtracts to it. If this policy is adopted, I would assume that we would be looking at funding this over a period of time going forward. Yeah, and that's one of the kind of one of my next bullet items is you know, I've got the general comments, target levels, and then how to fund them over time. Because, like I said, if we if we suddenly went to the 15 percent minimum level and set that aside, there wouldn't be very much left in my accumulation fund. So, in that case, you would probably have to uh, set up a budget and and do the set aside funds a small bit every year until you achieved your target without. Even if you had to uh, adjust your operating budget downward, uh, yeah, and I guess maybe one way of looking at that particular bullet item is, um, boy, if, if you got the answer tonight, that'd be great. If we could figure out how to do it over time, I don't expect the answer tonight because it's a very comp. I mean, we've been fighting this for how many years now, just trying to meet our existing needs without now setting aside more money. Um, so yeah, if you, if you suddenly have the answer, I'm going to be astonished, but. <laughs> Um, maybe some strategies to help get there and some ideas and and maybe I don't know maybe akin to the, the to the pay parking item we considered a, um, last year when we considered that is um, rather than weigh in the pay parking itself um, so with rather than weigh in on, on the exact how we get there procedure itself um, maybe some ideas to be considered things to, to throw on the table to for the city and whether that means a, a some sort of task force or a committee or a staff working group I'm not quite sure how we'll put all this together um, things to be considered and, and one of the things you just mentioned is you know the operating budget well if you know if, if maybe we squeeze our operating budget back X percent under certain areas and and go under austerity under certain areas to start putting some money that may be one of the things you throw on the table to consider so maybe that's where we can get tonight if you've got any ideas along those lines Dana, did you have a comment? Uh, just from what you just said, that last couple sentences, I would rather see, instead of reducing services because of cost budget cuts or anything, you know, I would rather see revenues created. And if it's parking, then it's parking. Um, any tourist town you go to, you pay for parking. It's 20, 30, th bucks a day if you're in San Diego if you're in San Francisco um, we're kind of growing up in Morro Bay if it could, was just a small amount it would be something so I think that's just the kind of input we're looking for in terms of you know strategies for getting there create revenue first cut last Mark. stuff like that yeah I would see that if, if this was to be enacted, we would have to have some form of a three to five year ongoing revenue enhancement plan, which may undertake several different forms, you know, but nothing that's ever binding, but something that gives us a, a pathway to run down with regard to uh, revenue enhancement because nothing happens instantaneously and we're not going to get to this budget shortfall through another bake sale type thing. So we need to have something that's longer term. That has a lot more legs to it than uh, to be able to undertake additional funding for this in addition to the costs that we currently have for capital outlays. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Anything else from? board can target levels I, I mean we're, we're 15 percent minimum 25 percent target um, that's the GFOA I wouldn't suspect the Harbor Advisor boys would want to go against that but unless you have some other ideas I mean one idea set the minimum lower than 15 percent for starters and trying to achieve that first I mean I'm just throwing ideas against the wall I mean, something's better than nothing, even if it's not, you know, up there in the uh, unobtainable percentages. At least you get something going. So if it were 10% or 12%, if it seems more feasible. 
Like you, you said, you've been working at this a lot for a long time. If you're going to lower the percentage, then wouldn't you want to uh, increase the uh, demand of reaching that percentage? The length of time to get there? But either in time, in yes, in time, that you would have to set, you're going to set your goal low, but you would have to set the demand very high to make sure that you get there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it becomes something of, well, it doesn't really... It doesn't matter, it's not worthwhile enough to really tighten our belts and do something about it. There has to be a bit more pressure. Just thought. Did Ron give you any comments on this item? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you would have some if you were here. <laughs> Yes, well, I, I think it's a percentage in time is the, is the question. You, you can have a goal of being at 25% in 25 years and be 1% per year, right. or you could have a goal of being you know 15% in 15 years, or you can have a goal to be 15% in two. It's, both those items, both with regard to the percentage and the time frame, have significant impact on what your annual outlay basically becomes. Mm -hmm. So do you have an idea of when you'd like to get there? Well, the policy envisions three years to get to the minimum. So that's 5% a year to get to 15. So what, what was 15%? What did I say, 250,000? Hang on. So what is that, 75 a year? Yeah. Yeah, eighty something a year. Oh, and you had a comment? Oh, I think he was kind of answering. Oh. Would you feel that eighty three a year would be a feasible number that you could work to without hindering the funding of the operations or the moving forward of the capital outlays that are required? I wish I had our excess revenue of our expenses last year before answering that because this year is really going to be an indicative year you know we've gone through you know with the economic downturn um, we finally turned the corner a few years ago and started getting back up on the right end our, our revenues we went from about two million dollars a year down to about 1.5 1.6 they slowly started climbing back up and then over a period of about two years things really skyrocketed and started looking really great and now they think we've plateaued off so when I look at this year versus last year it looks like we're at the plateau um, this year is the second year of the plateau and I think we're leveled off from a revenue standpoint and then you know normal CPI type stuff or unless something else major changes on our waterfront so I don't know where we stood revenues versus expenses this year and I wish I did because that would give me a better idea because enough if I knew, oh, I put you know one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars more in the bank last year, great. Now I know where I'm at. I don't know where I'm at last year yet, so it's kind of premature in that regard to, to answer that question. Versus, oh, uh, we only put thirty thousand a year in the bank. Well, okay. Well, there's our there's our you know half of our third to get there. Thank you. Yeah. Year by year, are you seeing the costs, like over five years, incrementally go up a certain percentage a year, or the expenditures? I, I didn't follow you. Um, so the the operating expenditures last year were like one point seven million dollars. Mm -hmm. Is that pretty comparable, or is it go, uh, is it going up significantly every year? Or? It's pretty. It, now it's pretty comparable uh, over the last oh, I want to say th three or so years three or four years the PERS pension costs really spiked there were some because of all the changes that have been happening in, in uh, Sacramento over over PERS pension costs and how they allocate those costs and the amount they require you to put aside there were some big hits on all the funds, not just the Harbor Fund, but the general fund. And those are 
finally starting to stabilize out and should be stabilized out within the next couple of years. Um, so that will help. Um, but in general, you know, expenses follow CPI up and down and follow the economy pretty, hmm. pretty closely and our expenses have gone up and down with it and revenues as well. Hmm. So if you have something, hopefully if something big like that kind of stabilizes, that might make some room. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and what's going to make a big difference for us is our South Tier loan of 134,000 a year. Uh, doesn't sound like much, but for a two million dollar budget, it's a fair amount of money, and and that's got four or five years left on it right now. So once that's gone, that's you know like paying off your house. You no longer have that payment anymore. Suddenly, I'm going to have 134,000 dollars extra to spend. So that's going to bring a good amount of relief. Yeah, it's all almost 417,000 over three years, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, as far as new revenue, you have a lot of the Pipkin leases, and they're coming up. Um, are you expecting more income from that? They are up as of about five days ago. Um, <laughs> okay. One is a Libertine pub, um, currently in an interim lease. With as I spoke earlier, the, that leaseholder is proposing to um, propose on the larger market square project and combine that site with that one. Um, I'm going to probably have Lori kick me over here and the rest of the Pipkins. The aquarium. Um, we just went through a lengthy expose on that so we know where that is. Who are my other Pipkins? Giovanni's Fish Market. Um, on the market side, he's on a Pipkin. So that one's up. Gray's Inn, which I'm in the middle of negotiating right now and they're They've, the grazing owners have put in a proposal on the Kayak Horizons RFP, which was due last Friday. Um, so we'll be daylighting that before too long, and they've got a proposal over there, so um, we'll see where that goes. So they'll have a, they'll help. I mean, our, our leases in general, short of any major changes, um, they're not going to be the answer. Um, for the long term, you know, over long, long term, you know, they're all, you know, 20 to 50 year leases and there's a fair amount of 50s out there. We've got a few new ones coming on, like I say, with these Pipkins and we'll get some percent rents out of them, hopefully. Um, it really, uh, it, to me, it relies on on increased revenue, uh, new and increased revenue streams. You know, Dana's talking parking and things like that. Paid parking. Okay, so a lot of them are coming up. Are you using the criteria that you have on the current leases, um, like the committee that the document that you gave that says that retail is five, bar is ten? Is it going to be like that, or is everything's negotiated? Are they more towards that or less towards that for each one of these? That is our standard right now. We're just embarking on a lease policy update which I'm sure is going to touch on the percentage in the rental fair market value. I mean, that was one of the things council brought up when we had it in front of them a couple of weeks ago. So we will be looking um, closely at that. Like I said, I don't, you know, we're, we're not operating right now currently with our leases on one extreme or the other when it comes to revenue compared to other title and trusts. We're not down at the bottom, you know, scraping it and not making what everybody else is making, but we're not killing it on the opposite end either. We're, we're somewhere in the more or less normal middle, so, you know, we're not an outlier, and there's there's not that many old leases, you know, when the real big change occurred and, and started with, probably with Stan Trapp and Marina Square when that redeveloped, you know, we used to have all the funky little individual small sites that just we're on minimum leases, minimum rent leases, and then Stan Trap and Dutchman and Roses, and when that whole wave has gone through, we're kind of winding down to the end of that wave. At this point, there's no real big, major redevelopments that I foresee coming. Most of them have happened. A couple more, and those will help. Any other comments? Okay. Okay. All right. Can we close that and go on to our next item, which is eelgrass. So the eelgrass committee met um, on, well, you remember that last month we talked about the eelgrass and the framework 
plan with the framework that was in it that was given to us by Anchor QEA. Uh, the, uh, NEP had a meeting after we received that. Uh, the NEP direct board of directors had a meeting to discuss the items in that framework that were designated by QEA that the NEP could be of great value or perhaps assume a major responsibility for. In their directors meeting, uh, the directors hesitate to take primary responsibility for the mitigation actions which are listed in that framework and for the monitoring that was also listed as would be part of their their responsibility they feel they are a research agent they are a research uh, and investigative uh, their mission is investigation and scientific research into factors that affect, affect eelgrass in the bay, but to become uh, the major agency for uh, carrying out mitigation action and surveys, they hesitate to accept that. So they are still very interested in continuing their work in sharing their in their knowledge in sharing their resources with proponents as the proponents would have projects that would need or could uh, could make use of the information which they have um, the monitoring that the NEP does is a um, uh, annual surveys of the entire bay as well as close monitoring of their uh, eelgrass planting that they t undertake but this would not be and is not directed toward the actual result of the small plantings that are done by project proponents when they have an impact on eelgrass so if a project um, impacts one square meter of eelgrass, then they have to trend. They have to plant one square, 1.2 square meters of eelgrass in another area. It's a 1.2 to one for the impact, and the NEP doesn't do their planting quite that way. Perhaps over time, the some of the results of the NEP's plantings could be shifted over and they could get credit for it, but at this point they cannot assume the responsibility for doing that. Still, the NEP is very interested in continuing its collaboration on um, developing a, an eel, a comprehensive eelgrass management policy. Uh, Kathy Novak, as you all know, is a major player in consulting on getting the permitting and arranging for the monitoring, the transplanting, and all the surveys for her clients. And she feels that development of the comprehensive eelgrass management, even without the NEP actually performing the mitigation. Uh, the contractor would have to work with a private um, entity that would do the mitigation, utilizing some of the knowledge and uh, advice from the NEP. Kathy feels that this would still be very important and could be very helpful to her clients. So since um, we still don't know anything from the regulatory agencies and how they look on this plan, and that remains to be the next step. Um, uh, what else? 
so that was that was the result of the uh, committee meeting and the eelgrass policy framework plan and or framework from our committee meeting on the 26th any questions comments Eric no, I'll let you, I guess, let the board sort of deliberate on that part, and then I'll jump into my spiel on, on where I think we need to go with this. Okay. Just out of point of curiosity, where does one get eelgrass to plant? Is there an eelgrass nursery or a rookery somewhere that we're creating eelgrass seedlings to... Uh, go forward with that has been a problem and in, in fact they haven't been able to approve any project because there isn't much you can't take eelgrass there's a what is the term I want Perfect. no 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 uh, you're not allowed to impact eelgrass in that way because we don't have enough of it so right now nobody is getting permits if there is if their project involves an impact on eelgrass because there's no way to mitigate for it even though eelgrass is growing along the bay and we can see it along the north end of the bay it's flourishing down in front of the uh, harbor office in front of the oyster oyster factory there not the oyster factory Neil Maloney's place uh, it's growing down at the Yacht Club, and <laughs> at times at low water is um, sort of a detriment because the small boats run over it and get tangled in it. But you're not allowed to take it. There is a no-take policy for eelgrass. So this is one of the this is one of the problems. Um, speaking of that. Um, can we import eelgrass? I mean, is there a private eelgrass propagator or something uh, with the same species? I mean, I mean, it can't be too much different on one ar area of the coast to another. Um, I, think, I think you said that about mussels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but if you look at the other estuaries along the California coast where eelgrass grows, they also have a problem with it because it's dying throughout the world, not just on the California coast or in the U.S. Uh, Humboldt Bay, we've seen their comprehensive management plan. Um, I, they do have some excess that I think they use for, for transplant. Uh, Newport they have a comprehensive management plan, but their uh, their projects are different. They are dealing much more just with uh, dredging projects, whereas ours are local development along the waterfront, such as uh, Gray's wanted to put in some more slips. Uh, and they would be hard pressed to do that if they if they are going to impact the eelgrass. Well, now, uh, last year when uh, NEP did their transplant and did some of their projects, they took some eelgrass from in front of Coleman Beach, but they got a special permit, I think, to do that. I'm not I'm not sure what kind of a permit, but I think Lexi said they had. So with, um, I know that the Lexi, they want to do research. Right. Um, have they done research as to where the eelgrass is doing really well and what the environment is like, nutrient rich? What is, is the yeah. Humboldt Bay next to the pulp mill and we should feed it some paper? There are, there were, 17 different projects for research on eelgrass in Morro Bay over the last year. Many of these projects are now coming to fruition and we should have final results perhaps over the next six months to a year, year and a half. Uh, those included DNA, they included water quality, 
they in, it included um, what were some of the others? The DNA, the water quality, the salinity of the water, uh, and several other factors that affect eelgrass. So the NEP will have those at some time and they will get collated and they will be disseminated. So that's what we know. Um, still, the having a comprehensive management plan in Morro Bay could set a standard for permitting and it could assist in permitting because they have to deal with some six or seven different permitting agencies, regulatory agencies. If the, so right now they have to go to each one. They will, the proponents will still have to go to each of the agencies and get their permits. But if you have a comprehensive management plan from the city that recognized the um, recognize the requirements for each of the regulatory agencies and the regulatory agencies recognize the fact that the city's uh, eel grass management plan uh, took into account the various requirements it could make permitting much easier because the regu regulatory agencies already know that we're taking these factors into account. And so it could reduce the cost of that and the difficulty of getting permits. Okay, so that management plan of those agencies. Yep. Working through the city. Right. That's, that sounds really good. The yep. big problem is the mitigation. It's like there's nobody to do the mitigation. Oh, well, there are, no, there are, there are people who do the mitigation. There's Tanera, is that, I have that right. Uh, there is a company called Tanera and they have done mitigation in Humboldt in, uh, here in Morro Bay and, uh, yeah, they're around. So, so they managed to do it. If right now it's a difficult period but it could be that with the growth of the eelgrass that we're seeing this year and last year, uh, that some of those problems would be somewhat alleviated because there could be some excess eelgrass that they could take and transplant. So you're looking for a recommendation from the HAB on the plan? On the framework. On the, okay. On what, the okay. Given the fact that we don't know, uh, we don't know exactly what the regulatory agencies will say or how they will, they will uh, react. They do have, where Kathy has talked to them, they do have a positive attitude toward us developing this. We need more data. So I would like to see, the committee would like to see uh, that we have a motion to recommend that the HAB recommend to the city count that the city council support the efforts in pursuing further developing and adaptive and adapting the plan framework with the goal of establishing a city eelgrass management policy and that this include directing the harbor department to take the next step of presenting the plan framework to the relevant regulatory agencies for their comment and further input. <laughs> so <laughs> <I would> like moved. <laughs> yeah. Discussion. Um, my, my main concern would be that from reading this, it looks like initially the city would be on the hook for develop, um, once, not just, not just for the framework portion, but once everything was all in motion, the city would be on the hook for developing some sort of a project <coughs> and getting the ball rolling, and then hopefully um, being reimbursed by projects as they come along. Um, 
and if if there were a few more bad years of eelgrass following the city getting the ball rolling so to speak that could be a lot of money it, um, might, it might be hard to recover i mean the city is not going to assume the responsibility for mitigation activities the city is on um, this has a certain amount of oversight over the general plan and what happens some of that uh, the the uh, comments in red on your eelgrass uh, on the framework those are common those were suggestions in order to ease the burden on the NEP we recognize that those are things that the NEP is going to require we also recognize that when we get more input from the regulatory agencies many other things are going to be changed so rather than changing each of these piecemeal as they come about we talk to the regulators we get their input we find out what they want and then we adapt our plan to suit uh, both the regulatory agencies and the NEP and what they are able to do so it's uh, my motion mostly says let's go ahead and get input from the regulatory agencies before we discard this whole thing and present it to the City Council um, to get to make sure that they're on board um, so that we're taking a couple more baby steps forward toward development of the plan toward development of the framework uh, before we end up going off in a direction that either the regulatory agencies or the City Council disapproves of Eric do you want to mm -hmm. No, my head's going north south. Yeah, I think I I, I want to read your motion again there, but I, it just let me make sure you're capturing what I think you've captured. Um, we're we're the HAB's putting its its stamp of approval on the plan or the, or the framework, whatever we want to call it, and moving that forward and recommending the council accept it, given the NEP's changes to it. I didn't. I, there's two frameworks or two reports in the staff report because I I didn't want to send anchor on a um, constant revise 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 I just wanted to give them a one final so NEP gave us their input and so I'm, uh, I'll have them incorporate that into the final product but um, assuming the have is is recommending approval of that plan um, to the City Council and the, and the council endorse it and direct staff to pursue the next steps the next step being hiring probably anchor to go talk to the regulators on a fairly short order and just see what their buy-in on it is and if, if their buy-in is good um, then we keep moving forward if they say no you got to live within the skimp or the camp or whatever it's called uh, then we're pretty well dead on trying to pursue this plan any further so is that what you captured in that I paraphrase that badly enough or I think I do you want me to reread it yeah would you <laughs> I move or we move that the have recommend that City Council support the efforts in pursuing and further developing and adapting this plan framework with the goal of establishing a city eelgrass management policy that this include directing the Harbor Department to take the next step of presenting the plan framework as written by QEA to the relevant regulatory agencies for their comment and input on further development. So that's saying that we want to present this to City Council, the QEA, without the changes by mm -hmm. um, NEP. With the NEP changes, recognizing those changes that they're they're in a little changes. different than Anchor originally envisioned. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you captured it there. I, the first time you read it, it just—it was a lot for me to try and absorb all at once. So I think you captured it all there. So, 
the Harvard, Harvard, Harvard Department would talk to the agency and find out this information, not Anchor QE? Anchor, well, QEA. they will probably hire Anchor to talk to the agency since they have a depth of knowledge on what has happened in other areas. They have worked on the Humboldt plan. They have worked on the Newport plan. They did Newport, didn't they? Yeah, they yeah. did Newport. Um, when the gentleman came and, and spoke, know who. yeah, he he know he deals with these agencies yes. all the time. So I I think that's great. That's yeah. the way it should be. Um, I'm just want just one more question would be like, how much does that cost? So my my next step after assuming you approve this is I'm gonna I'm gonna circle this back to the council because we got to make sure the council's still on board. Uh, I'll get Anchor to give me a proposal on doing this next step to the regulators and if I can fit it in my operating budget, great. If I need a little extra money from accumulation, not so great, but I don't suspect it's gonna be you know, a five or six figure item. It should be fairly simple and straightforward. Um, go to council, get councils, yeah, we, we, uh, we accept the Harbor Advisory Board's recommendation and direct you to go do this. I'll bring them a cost. Um, and where I'm going to pull it from, assuming they say go, then we'll go with Anchor and go to the regulators and see what they say and circle back with whatever that result is. Mark? You're looking at me like you want to say something. Um, um, <laughs> I would, oh. um, yeah, um, I was, the as far as the cost of, of, you know, just getting Anchor to consult with the regulators, but also the initial cost to this, the city would be nice to know. Because um, that, I mean, it will it will be significantly less expensive than like a mitigation bank or something like that. But I know those sorts of mitigation schemes are, you know, in, into the tens of millions of dollars potentially. Um, so how how much cheaper would this be? And I asked him last time. I thought he was gonna um, give something related to that. But. Jack. Jack Malone, the guy who yeah, came yeah, and yeah, talked to yeah, us yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Jack Malone. Yeah, I'm sure he would have some idea. Uh, probably. But no, it seems like it seems like a, a better option than not being able to do anything. So. And that is sort of the alternative. <laughs> well, the end game on this is. Obviously, there's going to be a cost to it, <laughs> to the city, and I appreciate your sensitivity to try and recoup some of that, but um, coming up with some sort of approved plan that is better than the existing plan that encourages and fosters development is really the end game, and that's what we're trying to do is basically economic development in a way by trying to remove barriers to it. And this is removing a barrier, and yeah, there's going to be a cost to that. Hopefully, in the long run, we can get slips built and expanded and things happening on the water that generate revenue. And save eelgrass. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Are we ready for a vote? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you. One more down for eelgrass. <laughs> ah, and that is our third topic for the evening. We are up to declaration of future agenda items. So our current list. Do we have, uh, does anybody want to make some suggestions or have anything to add to our current list of agenda items? Yes, ma'am. On, where is it? Partly to do with creation of Embarcadero Business District, and oh, I don't see it on here. Identify. Okay, so um, one of the things for future that was um, brought up last week was um, the cleanliness of the Embarcadero and who is responsible for that, master leaseholders or um, or the city, and. Uh, I would like to um, add that I would want to know what um, legal parameters we have on the Embarcadero um, for 
one for who, who it actually is responsible for taking care of that and if we can um, work towards having a, a cleaner Embarcadero um, and then also we have an issue with um, loitering vagrants possible um, nefarious uh, dealings <laughs> on the Embarcadero and it's looking really bad it's looking um, like you don't want to walk past a large part of the very center of the Embarcadero so if we can have somebody come and speak with us as far as what legally we can do in order to to move them <laughs> or or make sure that they they don't just hang around and um, you know make make the Embarcadero look like a place where um, pedestrians just don't feel safe um, so and then um, also because we were talking about um, leases and negotiation. Uh, um, oh, maybe we should deal with these okay. one by one. We need at least a second uh, to put it on the agenda. So on your first point of uh, restroom maintenance, we have discussed that before. Um, but it sounds like you are asking for what? Well, last week, Ron, um, John, Joan Sulu, she put in a request for us to talk about it, and he said it would be a future conversation. So I just want to add to that that it's not necessarily just cleanliness. It's just it's we should add to that the fact that um, loitering and other situations that are going on in the Embarcadero, if we can include that in one kind of conversation and have possible legal um, guidance as to what it is that we can do either both to clean it up with the people that are there and the trash that is there does that make sense okay your microphone maybe adding the verbiage to the last uh, bullet point that says and a concern for public safety Okay. Identify so. review responsible parties for cleanliness of waterfront, ground lease sites, public restrooms, and light posts, and public safety. And concerns for public safety. Okay. Since we're going to be having a forum on the 11th, the city is uh, regarding the wind, ener wind energy. Do we take that off of our agenda item? Or do we just leave it on there in case there's something we want to discuss regarding that? I guess we want to just leave it on there. I think, if I recall correctly, that was put on as as was warranted as things developed, an informational item for the Harvard Advisory Board. It wasn't a input kind of thing. It was just a, hey, when there's something significant or new or when it develops for enough along to bring to the HAB to give us some information, give us some information. Um, so that the, could go the, the thing next week is largely that. Exactly. That's kind of what I'm saying. But maybe after that, down the road, we want to talk about it again, so I would just leave it there if things... But well, I guess we could leave it there from the sense of an informational item after next week. Um, we go into closed session, I forget the date, and, and consider a community benefits agreement with, with Trident Winds. Maybe by November, we might have enough to update it and things might have happened. Fisherman's Agreement is probably going to be signed by then. I think you guys are like on the verge. And so there'll be some good information and, and good update stuff to bring. So I, I'd probably leave it on there. Okay. Um, and then this one that's been on here for quite a while. Uh, exploring the benefits of becoming a harbor port district. 
I know that's kind of a tough issue and probably uh, a lot of work. Um, do you see a, a way to get to that? Um, does the HAB need to give you help with that, or, or well, that is think? a you know I'll, that is a hairy item. It's got a lot of fur on it. <laughs> um, it's no small task to create a, a special district or. Um, I guess the reason I say that is because when I look at review of TBID assessment funding and, and just different things, or mm -hmm. there was a, an agenda item. Uh, uh, future ag agenda item about uh, making a business district or, or something, you know, and I thought, well, what if we're looking at other things and well, you had the, we've got the business district that. item on there, which is basically market our business owners getting together and, and putting together a, a bid of their own to fund whatever they want it to fund. The, the bigger one, Explore Benefits of Becoming a Harbor Port District, that is the big furry one that um, while there's, you can explore the benefits of becoming one um, and maybe sort of flesh that out, the actual effort to do it is pretty monumental and without council direction to do so um, and the council will to go there, it, that would go nowhere. Um, so I, the exploring part is, is kind of a subset that, to answer your question, you need some help, yeah, write my staff report. Um, <laughs> we could outline the benefits of it and then say, okay, here council, here's the benefits. With everything going on right now, I, I don't know that that one's going to go. Oh anywhere. yeah, I know, it's not something I wanted to see right away, but yeah. I just thought I'd bring it up just for conversation like someday. <laughs> Keep it alive. <laughs> Keep it alive. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. I have one more yeah. possible discussion. As far as the eel grass plan that you're working on, it, it it's it's an animal that is dealing with the fact that there is our projects that are taking it away and so how do we replace it? Um, reading and, and learning more and knowing what I knew from before, eel grass we have a problem all over the state of California. And there's gotta be a reason why this is happening. Um, has there been any research done as far as pesticides and runoff with Roundup? And um, I, when Roundup actually came on the market, did we see an actual, is this, is this the moment where we saw the significant decrease in it? And what as a city that is affiliated with the ocean can we do if that could possibly be an issue? As I stated, there were some 17 projects, investigatory projects, research projects done by Cal Poly. I don't remember that pesticides was any was a specific one in that they did look into oh water temperature you had, you've had Cal Poly Sea Grant you've had NEP you've had state and federal regulators and environmental organizations looking at yeah there's been there's tons of research done to try and figure it out and they don't have an answer yet and I can't imagine they've overlooked that kind of stuff if you look at a world map that shows eelgrass, uh, just as we have gone from 344 acres down to 13 acres, uh, the same phenomena has happened around the world. So you could get a list of those projects if you want to investigate them. Um, I can send them. To, I can send you the list. Okay, great. I would love to read them. Well, you don't really have much to read yet because they have not been published. It's just a list of what they are investigating. So, back to our future agenda items. Um, <laughs> Can I make another motion that we adjourn? Of course. <laughs> All second. All in favor?
too.